You know, sometimes we have this illusion that power can be balanced under the right circumstances for individuals, or for groups or whatever. But the truth is there's always this uh, imbalance in a power dynamic in one direction or another. And that's just part of human nature and human existence in groups and otherwise. But in this video, we're going to focus on the, the nature of power and how to negotiate power within the context of a group then and then working within a group, um, that power dynamic. So first of all, let's determine what we mean by power. Power is very simply the ability to influence the attainment of goals sought by you or others. So if you have any kind of influence over someone else or the behavior of someone else, the attitudes of someone else, the, the outcome in some way, then you have power by definition, right? So power is just the ability to influence the attainment of goals sought by you or others. And there are different types of power that we can look at. Just very quickly, we're just going to look at the different types of power. There's what we call power over, which just means you, for example, person A is in a position of power and they have authority or some influence over others and, and others are going to kind of be followers in that instance or be influenced more heavily in that instance. So somebody has power over others. Uh, you can also have power from within, which is just sort of this self-confidence and um, the ability to to. to to speak your mind and be comfortable doing that regardless of the circumstances. And it's when you have that power from within, I mean, against that comfort level with speaking up and, uh, and making your voice heard and those types of things. And then there's power with, which has to do with the, the power that we experience within a group of others, that, that, that there is power within the collection of people and power with that group that we feel empowered by being a part of that group and the group feels empowered um, by the collectiveness of of the people that are that are involved in it then one you know kind of negative aspect of power that we that we have to think about is is oppression uh, because as spider-man taught us with great power comes great responsibility right and as he found out there are ways that that power can be used for good and ways that it can be used for not so good purposes and and we are really responsible for that. The, the power that we have of the hammer over the egg, for example, a hammer can be a wonderful tool, a powerful tool, and uh, and be very valuable in creating and and doing lots of good work. But uh, then it can also be used for very damaging uh, purposes as well. So the the hammer and the person behind it more has the has a great deal of power, and we need to wield that power responsibly and effectively in groups and, and otherwise and when we fail to do that we have what we call oppression right and oppression is just the unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power especially uh, by the imposition of burdens so oppression becomes this anchor and people you know are the, are in that balloon then right we are that balloon and oppression is what's anchoring us down we, we throw up obstacles for people and make it more difficult to do anything and uh, you know we think uh, back for example in the, in the jim crow era of the united states history especially in the south the jim crow era where you know okay black people have the right to vote right? african americans have the right to vote but we're going to throw up all these other th obstacles that make it much much more difficult for them so that they legally yes have the opportunity and the right to vote just like everybody else right but we make it so so difficult that's oppression Right? When when people who are in power use that power to make things more difficult uh, for people who don't have that power, that is oppression. And so that's a problem with power. That's the kind of the dark side of power, so to speak. And so we need to be aware of that. And so and it, it comes in all forms. But so specifically within groups, if we're looking at groups, there are some bases of power developed by French and Raven, researchers named French and Raven. These bases of power that they identified were, were typically power comes from one of these sources. If somebody has power, has the ability to wield that kind of significant influence, it generally comes from one of these sources. First, you have referent power, referent power, which is just we somebody we look up to, right? Somebody we, we, we uh, idolize or respect in some way. And so they wield influence over us by virtue of that kind of uh, that that the view that we have of them. So this is why, for example, celebrity endorsements and uh, and and popular influencers have referent power, right? Even when they're speaking, they're doing a commercial about something that's not in their area of expertise or whatever. We think, oh wow, I really like this person, I admire this person, I want to be like this person, and if they use this product, then I need to use it too. So this referent power, just somebody we look up to, the cool kids, right? That that 
but somebody we re we hold in regard or respect for whatever reason, um, they can wield that influence over us in, in some ways with that referent power. We also have what we call expert power. Expert power is just what it sounds like. It's somebody who's an expert in that area. So they have power by virtue of their expertise. We, we look to them and, and they, they wield, um, heavier influence within that area because they have a level of expertise there, right? So, um, if we were in a group, all of us together and communication is my field. And if you, if that's not your field and we were working on a communication related thing, then I would have expert power in that area because that's something that I've studied and it's it's my field of expertise right so I have expert power in that but if we were working in a group and, and trying to come up with a solution to some sort of uh, aeronautical engineering problem then that would not be my field of expertise we would look to somebody who's an aeronautical engineer or has some experience in that field or something of that nature if somebody ha would have expert power right but not me so expert power is contingent upon having expertise in that area. But if you do, then you can wield that kind of influence and power um, using that expertise. Legitimate power is power that comes or influence that comes from legitimate sources, what we call legitimate sources. This is, you know, essentially somebody who has higher hierarchical status than you. So it's your boss, for example, somebody who is uh, your superior in the, in that uh, hierarchical chart or, or sense, right? That they have that kind of power or they have a, you know, they're an elected official. The judge has power to, to uh, control the courtroom and to do sentencing and things like that because they have that legitimate power, that power that's been vested in them by their position. So that's what we mean by legitimate power. Let's have, you know, kind of two sides of the, the opposite sides of the coin here are reward power, which is just what it sounds like, the ability to reward people and to offer incentives and to provide benefits to people for for following your lead and for doing what it is you think they should do. Uh, and on the opposite side of that, then we have coercive power, which is the, the power to uh, punish people if they don't do those things. So we uh, can wield influence through punishment right so reward and coercive power kind of the carrot and the stick if people do what we say we can reward them with the carrot if not then we can punish them with the stick right so to use that old expression power typically comes from one of these sources the one or more it could be that you have more than one of these but uh, um but you know so uh, the, one of these one or more of these bases of power will will be um at work in for individuals in a group and then you have this whole mix of things so what what if you have somebody in the group who has legitimate power they have you know some sort of they've been appointed as the leader of that group but you also have somebody who's an expert or somebody who has uh, the ability to offer rewards and you have these different powers then that can compete against one another it's not exclusive and somebody may have a you know, more than one of these. So, you know, somebody may be the boss, right? Which may mean they have the, the ability to reward and to punish. So they may have reward power and coercion power in addition to legitimate power. And potentially they could be an expert too right, in that area. And potentially they could be somebody you look up to. It's potentially somebody could have all five of these powers. And that would be, you know, a, a great combination if you're trying to lead that group. Um, or you could have one or, or some combination of those. But you're going to see these bases of power in groups. And uh, and so um, how we use them then, uh, the way that we use them will will oftentimes influence the amount of cooperation we get in a group and the type of cooperation we get in a group uh, from, the, from the other members of the group. So there are basically three, uh, you know, on this spectrum, we're going we're gonna to say there are essentially three ways that people will respond to this power. Okay. Typically, we're going to see either resistance where people are really pushing back and they're, they're resisting um, where we're leading. They're resisting that influence and they're resisting the use of that power and, and basically working against that. Or we could see compliance, which is they're going to do it, but they're not going to be happy about it. And they may just do what's required of them. They may not do any more. They're not doing it with a you know, that, 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 uh, with a happy spirit and they're not really putting additional effort into it. They're going to do it, but only what's required of them and and then you know kind of half-heartedly in a sense and then we could have commitment that's another potential so we could have people who are not only going to do it but they're going to do it well and they're going to put their all into it they're going to go above and beyond and so forth and when we use these different kinds of power we see different levels of cooperation within that um so this is true in groups this is true for uh, employees from a, you know in a hierarchical sense as well but uh so when we um uh, when we 
uh, use these different kinds of power, we see different responses as a result. So, for example, when we use coercion, when we use that punishment, it's not really as effective as other you know, types of power. We normally see resistance. You know, if the only thing we're offering people is punishment, then uh, then if we get something out of them, it's going to be with great resistance. They're going to they're going to resist. You know, they don't want to be punished, but maybe. But uh, but they also don't like being controlled in that way, probably and being threatened in that way. Um, and it's a little better when we see reward and legitimate power in, in use. We get compliance typically. Um, we'll get maybe what we want or need out of that, but not much more. And people aren't going to be very happy about it in the long term. It's not ideal either. Um, and, uh, you know, because we want people to be more committed than that. But, uh, but if we just need somebody in the short term to, you know, reward power, legitimate power, those can be effective ways to gain compliance. But we see then, uh, you know, with when we look at commitment, Expert and referent power are the ways that we uh, secure commitment from people and, and, and see people going above and beyond and not just meeting the bare minimums and getting something done, but, but really them putting their heart into it as well. So, yeah. There are a variety of things that influence power and what we call these power dependencies, right? There are things that the elements and factors that, that um, determine how power can best be used and, and how effective it's going to be and, and what's going to work best in these situations. So we call these power dependencies, and there are really a couple of different elements that are important to consider here. First are the subordinates' values. What is it that they are, uh, what's important to them? What do they value? And how can we then meet that? If we, you know, we think of something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where can we meet them and fulfill whatever need it is they have in that sense? Are they, are they, do they value finances? Do they value those kind of rewards or do they value promotion? Do they value internal uh, rewards like just, you know, the satisfaction of a job well done? Um, or do they, you know, value external recognition through awards and things like that? So we need to figure out, you know, and, and identify and, and use what we know about their the subordinates values and consider that in that power um, equation. And that's a, a major power dependency is the subordinates values. We also need to consider the nature of the relationship in general. Um, are, is this somebody that is our coworker? Are they a colleague? Is it somebody we know well or don't know well? Is this a subordinate and we're their boss or vice versa? Uh, is it somebody who's a client and we work outside the, you know, I, there's any number of variables here, but we need to understand what the nature of our relationship is and, uh, and factor that into how we use power and how we can best apply power in those situations. Uh, that'll be important too, um, to understand you know, again, who is this person to me? Who am I to them? And what is the nature of our relationship? And how does that impact then the, the way that we can best uh, use power to influence things? Then we also need to understand counter power counter power, right? So what's the, you know, the opposite reaction. Every, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So, um, so what's the counter power that this person has? Um, you know, how much ability do they have to resist these things? And, and do they have, uh, you know, other things that work, how, you know, basically how strongly can we influence this person? So if we think about different counter power response patterns, and if we look at this graph, we can see we have, you know, one end where person A's power over B is very high, right? And, and they have a lot of, you know, influence, a lot of control over, over person B. And at the end of the other end of the spectrum, it's very low because person B's counter power is very strong over A. So they have ways that they can push back, whether that's, you know, maybe they got a secret file on stuff about person A, right? That they can, uh, that they can pull out this, uh, opposition file and use some embarrassing things. Or maybe it's just that, um, that they don't really need this job or this, this assignment or whatever. And so they, the person, you know, A can't really use that to influence them because person B could just walk away and it wouldn't be a big deal, right? So, um, what is person B's counterpower over A and how strong is that? Uh, and that's going to influence then, person B's response to A's influence, right? So how does person B respond to the, to the way that A is trying to influence them? If person A has a lot of power over B, if they're on the higher end of that spectrum, then person B is probably going to comply with person A, right? They're probably going to just go along. They're going to do it. You're not going to get a lot of argument. They're just going to, they're going to do it. If they don't have many other options, or at least don't feel like they do, then they're going to comply. 
as we go down here, though, we can see that, you know, a little, little more. And they may be able to bargain. They may have a little bit of counter power. So they may be able to, to bargain and get a better deal or whatever and uh, and maybe get a better, you know, I don't know what, a better position or better time, better whatever. They can they can negotiate a little bit, though, in this regard. If they have a little bit more counter power, they may even be able to fight with A and work against that and just, you know, completely um, countermand that and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to resist. I'm going to go against this. And if they have a lot of counter power, if they have ability to just walk away, they can just ignore A altogether, right? If this is a volunteer type situation, right? If you're volunteering somewhere and, and person A is really trying to influence you and use your power and you're just not having it, you can just ignore them, right? If you've got that kind of counter power, you don't really need this, then that, that can be a, you know, a potential response as well. So, but we can see that the more counter power person B has, uh, then the, the less, uh, strong, the less strength and the, the power and the influence that A will have over that individual. So we need to consider that as a, as a factor as well. So the subordinates values, the, um, the, um, uh, the counter power that A has or the B has in that situation. And, uh, and, and so just those elements that we need to consider the, the power dependencies, then, right? Okay, some common power tactics, and and I have you know Mr. Burns illustrated here because these are not great. These are these are typically not as effective, uh, in, in terms of power. These are things you can do when you have power, but and they may bring some short term gain, but in the long run, these are these are not great power tactics. These, but these are used things that are commonly used by people who want to use power to influence uh, the people in their group, and and but they're not great. So so uh, co people commonly ac or control access to information. They feel like if I'm the only one who knows everything, then then everybody else has to kind of defer to me if I'm the only person who has all this information. So they'll keep other people in the dark. They'll try and control access to that information. They'll control access to other persons, keep people in different silos. So again, they become the linchpin in this and nobody can really do anything on their own. It's another common power tactic that, that people use. Again, not very effective in the long run, but anyway, they have the selective use of objective criteria. So it's easy to kind of um, make sure you're getting really good evaluations if you're the one selecting the the evaluation criteria, right? If you're able to set those criteria, then, then you can select things that are going to be good for you, and you can ignore the things that are not going to be as good for you, right? So so people will empower will oftentimes be selective in the objective criteria, quote-unquote objective criteria that they use uh, for different evaluations and, and different situations. So they'll control the agenda. You know, just, you know, I can think about, uh, think about Congress. I think about Congress a lot when I think about this one. Um, the Speaker of the House, for example, determines if they have the majority, they can determine what comes up for a vote and what doesn't in Congress, right? And same with the Senate. They, they can control what's going to be discussed, what's going to be voted on. And if it's something they don't like, they don't have to vote against it. They can just not bring it up at all, not have it brought up on the floor at all, not allow it. So they can control the agenda. And that's a that's a power tactic that people use frequently, uh, using outside experts, bringing in people to support what you what you are trying to to sell to other people, uh, and then bureaucratic gamesmanship, just making the red tape so difficult to drives people nuts, and they just kind of give up, or or you know using this like Game of Thrones type behind the scenes power moves or whatever these power tactics, using those tactics, using those bureaucratic gamesmanship uh, to 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 control people through power. And then coalitions and alliances. Think about the, you know, a game like Survivor or something like that, um, that where he says coalitions and alliances to try and uh, exert power over other people or other groups or whatever. Again, these are these are common power tactics and they're used a lot and they can be effective, but they're probably only going to be effective in the short term. People are going to start to resist, and people are not going to be they're not going to like being controlled or being, you know, have, ha having uh, this kind of manipulation happen around them. So in the long run, it's probably not going to be great for uh, your, your prospects long term in terms of using power in that group. But uh, they can be effective in the short term and people use them a lot. But I don't know that they're the best way to go about things. So what I would recommend is that you consider uh, the ethical use of power, which we can look at through, again, this, this different um, um, different uh, bases of power that we talked about earlier. These the, the from French and Raven, the referent, expert, legitimate reward and course of power uh, that we discussed earlier. We can use these bases of power ethically. There are ways that we can, can you know, not control, but use these things 
ethically and 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 uh, use them well so for example with referent power we can uh, we can treat subordinates fairly we can defend our subordinates interests we can be sensitive to their needs and feelings we can engage in role modeling and show them um, what you know effective uh, productive group membership looks like and, and and what we need from them so we can do all of these things using and, and enhance and, and take advantage of our referent power if we have access to that if we have expert power, we can promote the image of our expertise. We can maintain credibility. We can act confidently and decisively. We can uh, keep people informed instead of controlling that information. We can be open and share that information. We can recognize employee concerns, all of this, you know, from the standpoint of our expertise, um, which will lend value and lend uh, weight to that as well. Then when we when we come at it from our vantage point of as an expert there. Even when we have legitimate power, when we are in control, when we are responsible for this group, we can still be cordial and polite. We can be clear and uh, and follow up to verify understanding uh, of group members. We can explain the reasons that we are making different requests, and and we can follow the proper channels and go through channels and and be um, uh, respectful regarding those things. We can enforce compliance of the different rules and not let things slip just because. You know, somebody is getting preferred treatment or whatever. We can be sensitive to our subordinates' concerns. And even when we are in, have legitimate power, we don't necessarily have to be sensitive to those things. We can do it anyway and wield that power ethically. Uh, in terms of reward power, we can make things, uh, we make feasible and reasonable requests. Um, we can attach those to our uh, rewards. We can offer rewards that are desired by subordinates. We can, you know, make, make them good rewards. And we can only offer credible rewards, right? Things that are legitimate, things that are, uh, that have value to those people and also are um, the legitimate and credible rewards. Uh, and when we have coercive power, um, it's not necessarily the ideal, but when we do need to use or have coercive power, we can inform subordinates of the rules and penalties, make sure they understand those and make sure that they are clear up front. We can warn people before punishing them. We don't have to automatically just bring down the hammer. We can give them some latitude and then um, and give them an opportunity to improve. And we can warn them before punishment. We can administer punishment consistently and uniformly, not show preferential treatment and and just do it, you know, be consistent and uh, and uniform in the administration of that punishment. We can make sure that we understand the situation before acting, not just respond impulsively or respond to the first thing we see, but understand really fully and explore that situation before we take action. We can make sure the punishment fits the crime. We can fit that punishment to the infraction, make sure that it is consistent with the, the level of severity of that infraction. And then we can punish in private. We don't have to make this a public spectacle. If we're going to have to punish, we can do so in a private way that doesn't you know, add additional embarrassment um, for that person. So now that we understand kind of you know what power is and, and how we can most effectively use it in a group, hopefully we'll be able to can wield that ethically and consider those those different bases of power and understand that there, there are ways that we can do those things and, and use that power ethically and really enhance our long term prospects for the group and our and our prospects in that group by doing so. If you have questions about power in small groups and how it's used, how we can how we can best manage and utilize and and leverage that kind of power for the betterment of the group, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to hear from you via email and chat with you in that way. Um, in the meantime, I hope that you do have a new understanding of power and the good that it can provide for groups um, when it's used in a positive manner.